So I'm here in the same conference in Queenstown with Tony Ives from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Thanks for joining us, Tony. Yeah, you're welcome. So um, you've written a few papers in MEE over the last couple of years, mm -hmm. and I'd just like to talk about a couple of them. Of course. That's right. Yeah. So I guess the first one on the agenda is uh, a paper titled, I don't have the exact title, it was Go Ahead and Log Transform Your Count Data when testing significance of regression coefficients? Something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I guess I was wondering where that, what, what the background to that paper was. Yeah, so the background was actually reviewers' comments. Um, I'd submitted a paper with a colleague. She'd done some really complicated um, LMMs that were spatial, um, really just looking for patterns. And we talked about doing spatial GLMMs and it was going to be a pain in the butt. So, um, so we just did them on log transform data. And one of the reviewers said, well, could you justify that? Um, so that kind of launched me off into, first of all, just doing the simpler case of GLMs and LMs. Um, and kind of finding some of my surprise that GLMs really have some problems with type one errors um, under very, very simple uh, conditions, very simple assumptions. Um, while at least if you're just interested in p-values and whether there is a rela relationship or not, the LMs worked really quite well. So that paper was really just a, a commentary that, you know, be a bit more careful with even pretty basic GLMs. And also, um, if, you, if you're just interested in, in is there a relationship or not, is it positive or negative, you can kind of rely upon what people have been doing for 60, 70 years or whatever, um, some very smart people, transform data. Um, I, I did caution that, you know, I'm going to use GLMs and GLMMs um, because they actually give you a model that's good to the data, you can simulate model, you can actually figure out if the model is giving you problems. Um, but still, if that's not what you're really interested in, um, you can go ahead and use LMs. Um, typically, you suffer some loss of power, um, which sometimes is not really much of an issue anyway. Um, so it was more a kind of throwback to more traditional views that what people have been doing for 60 years isn't all wrong. Fair enough. Yeah, so then I read that paper and um, I wanted to write a response to it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess, I guess part of the, I guess one aspect of it was that, like as you say, when testing is there a relationship, it will work uh, quite well. Uh, in terms of type 1 error control. Um, I guess one reason was that um, uh, if you test, if you've got a mean variance relationship and you're testing hypothesis, all means are equal. That implies all variances are equal. Yeah. And so I guess I wanted to look at uh, situations where you applied where the null hypothesis wasn't all means equal and show that it doesn't always, don't always pass the flying colors. So I wrote to you sort of saying that I was planning to do this and you said, can I be a co-author? Yeah. Yeah. Well, but, but you sent me an outline of what you were doing, and I yeah. pretty much agreed with it. Yeah. Um, yeah. What I particularly liked um, is in the final manuscript, you had a way of correcting for the, the problems. I guess it's way out of way. Of, yeah. um, yeah. For the GLM, and, and I mean, I thought that was great. Um, there was an interesting application for the LM because um, you have to, in a situation like that, you can use weighted regression where you weight by your independent estimates of the variance, um, which in some ways worked reasonably well. The final conclusion was kind of, I mean, my interpretation of the final conclusion was kind of similar to what I'd initially said, which is, sure, you can use LMs. Um, there's a loss of power, but they're reasonably robust. Um, but you don't have all of the advantages of, of model fitting, um, which I, I still very much support. So I, I actually really enjoyed what you did. Um, I just, I, I also had a bit of a bias that sometimes um, in the literature coming across as if people are disagreeing, sometimes that's nice because it forces people to hone their individual perspectives. But on the other hand, sometimes it's more confusing than not. And I thought in this case, actually, we agreed certainly a lot more than we disagreed. Yes, I wanted to thank you for um, for putting your hand up to be involved in that because, like as you say, it can get you, you get these sort of this person says this, this person says that. It's good to try and sort out a common position because there's you can do more iterations of talking to each other directly and then sort of come up with some sort of combined sort of position rather than sort of writing something and then they read it and write something back. You don't get. 
it's not a it's not a good form of conversation um, publication. No, and, and and actually, I, I should thank you because you were actually incredibly um, accommodating and understanding. So I, I really it was a it was a very very good experience. It was you. it was it was good fun. Yeah. yeah. So I guess the next paper was um, about uh, trait modeling. Yeah. 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 So this is actually work that Dai Zhong Li did, or. Um, yeah, Da Zhong Li. I guess if it's Chinese, that it would be Li Da Zhong. Um, but he was a graduate student in Madison, not my graduate student. But um, um, he got very much involved in phylogenetic um, um, analyses of community structure. Um, and one of the things that, that we got interested in was a problem that's really been well sorted out for just general comparative methods types of problems where you have you know, you're comparing species, um, those phylogenetic relationships among the species, so you can infer that there's going to be some um, between species correlation. And it's very, very well known from that literature that you are really subject to inflated type 1 errors if you don't take into account that type of correlation structure. I mean, it's a common feature of correlation, whether it's water correlation through time, spatial correlation, um, or phylogenetic correlation. Um, so what he did was do the same type of analysis when looking at trait by environment interactions, which is really, I think, a, 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 a much interest right now in the, the, the community ecology literature. Um, so he really showed that, yeah, people need to be aware of these of these correlations, um, that they can really, can really give you wrong p-values, um, p-values that are much lower than they, than they really should be. So I guess the idea was, okay, so incorporating phylogenetic structure in your error term to um, in case, and it wasn't just if you're expecting phylogenetic structure in your response, it's if you've got missing trait predictors. Yeah, um, so, so, so the, the whole question about phylogenetic um, structure in data um, is a kind of interesting one. Um, I, I approach it as a statistician that simply if your error terms are correlated and if that correlation has a phylogenetic structure, then you should try and take it into account for just statistical reasons. Of course, there's many, many people that are interested in the phylogenetic structure itself and infer evolutionary patterns, um, patterns of community assembly. Um, and that's kind of a, a different question, really. Um, um, for me, the most obvious possibility for um, evolutionary um, uh, phylogenetic patterns in error terms is simply, yeah, unmeasured variables um, that have phylogenetic signatures across species themselves. Um, and they're not measured, so they give you these, these error terms which are correlated. Um, other people might view those phylogenetic correlations as actually a, a direct consequence of the evolutionary process. Um, from a statistical point of view, it doesn't really matter where they come from. Um, yeah, you should you should be aware of them. Okay, fair enough. So I guess uh, one aspect of that sort of model it was it was assuming all of the correlation across species was phylogenetic. Because the models used in that paper. Um, it was assuming that the errors could have a phylogenetic signal, yeah. but then the actual extent of that signal was estimated yes. from the data directly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so basically then the phylogeny becomes a hypothesis yeah. about possible correlation structure. Yeah. Um, I mean, just st structurally, pragmatically, making some kind of an assumption like that is necessary because you have to, you have, to have a fairly simple assumption about a correlation matrix, uh, the correlation among the, the error terms. Um, because you can't estimate all of those correlations independently, simply because there's many too many of them if you have a lot of species. Yeah. So really the phylogeny, from a statistical point of view, is just a hypothesis about what that correlation structure looks like. Okay. Um, I, you mentioned earlier um, that you could have other hypotheses um, that um, would give you uh, correlation structure among species. Um, when yeah, you have so like a latent variable model, for example, yeah. spent a fair bit of time thinking about that sort of thing yeah. and how to incorporate correlation that you estimate from the data. Yeah. And so I look at the model and I want to get I want to get other sources of correlation into it as well as the phylogenetic. Yeah, no, so no, and I, I I think that's great um, because.
because yeah, from a statistical point of view, if those correlations exist, you should be aware of them. Yeah. And I guess until we fit those models, we don't know exactly. whether or not <laughs> it's there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, it's been a pleasure, Tony. Yeah. Thank well, you. Thank you.